to do the basics of nuclear medicine cardiology. Um, it's quite a big topic, but I think the radiopharmacy aspects of this is, is probably the least difficult. <laughs> so I think the interpretation of the scans, the physics, the imaging, all of that is quite complex, but the radiopharmacy side of things is not possibly the, the worst. But I I mean, I'm up for, for people having different opinions. So I will run through it and yeah, just cover the basics. I didn't, I tried to not go into too much research because this is also an active field of research and there will always be new radio pharmaceuticals on the horizon for all of these things. I know that the um, cameras is also gaining a lot of traction, new, new cameras, uh, fast imaging and I don't know, better resolution and all of that will also, of course, really make a difference in the future. So I'm just really focusing on radio pharmacy um, and I'm leaving up the, the interpretation of scans and the physics to the necessary people for that. So yeah, <laughs> let's get cracking. Um, so we will look at perfusion agents, hibernation studies, measuring ventricular, ventricular function, cardiac amyloidosis, <laughs> pharmacological intervention, and then myocardial metabolism agents. Yes, I English is not my first language, and um, even though I thought always I have a excellent English, these days it's uh, getting worse because I'm again, I'm now in, in Belgium and we speak Dutch here, so I even speak less English than I used to. So please excuse the pronunciation of all of these fantastic myocardial perfusion agents and all of that. So, okay. Uh, myocardial perfusion, of course, is a non-invasive method to assess coronary artery disease. Um, yeah, the radio pharmaceuticals should accumulate in the myocardium proportionally to the blood flow. And this is, of course, one of the major um, evaluations to see what is an ideal myocardial perfusion agent. So ideally, it should give you an accurate statement of the blood flow in the arteries. And we use it in the clinic to compare rest and stress images. Um, again, all of you are in the clinic, um, so you know more about all of these than I do. I will really just focus on the radio pharmaceuticals and how they accumulate, how they are labeled. So this is not to go into the technicalities or the clinical use of these agents. So I have here four SPECT myocardial perfusion agents. Um, I haven't focused on the nitrido complex at the end of the technetium. It's not really widely used. Maybe next year I will update the lecture and include a little bit more about it. That was maybe something I could have elaborated on. But we will cover Thallium 201 as a, I, I think, the original uh, myocardial perfusion agent, but also a really interesting pharmacokinetics and uh, just maybe a, a difference in It's very important to note how Thallium 201 work. Also, a different mechanism of biodistribution or, or accumulation. And then we will go to Systamibi and tetraphosphamine, which you guys are very familiar with. Um, so, the photon energy of, of thallium 201, the 62 to 82 GeV, is really where it's being hampered, as well as the production method that's expensive. So, thallium 210 is definitely not the ideal myocardial perfusion agent, but it's very interesting nonetheless. So, as you all know from your physics lectures, that 140 keV of technetium 99M is the ideal photon energy for imaging with SPECT or even scintigraphy because these cameras were originally developed for technetium. So, any other radionuclide that is not falling into the 140 keV range is less optimal. Um, and it also gives you a poor resolution. So the question would be how important it is for the specific application that you use. Myocardial perfusion, I think it's one of the applications where you would want more sensitive scans. We often had the discussion in the clinic is like how sensitive is, is the threshold because of course you don't want to overdiagnose the patient as well. So at the moment, all of the thresholds that's been put in place is for technetium tracers. Um, and therefore, 
it is standardized that if you see certain defects, it will lead to certain prognosis. So, of course, in the future, if you get better resolution with your SPIC cameras or you move into PET, you will have to consider these thresholds and reconsider it so that you don't overdiagnose the patient or, in fact, then underdiagnose if you have a less sensitive um, diagnostic technique. So, these are things you have to consider when you choose your radio pharmaceutical. Valium 201 is uh, definitely um, a different mechanism of accumulation. We will go into that, but it's active transport. So if you refer back to my lecture on the different mechanisms of pi distribution, you will see the differences. Active transport, you need energy. So there is a, a ATPase pump that needs energy, and then this will transport your radio pharmaceutical over the membrane of the myocardial cells. Whereas passive diffusion with your cystamibia and your tetraphosphine is passive and there is no energy needed. So it will transfuse through all the cells, not just the ones that are alive. The Phallium 201, like I said, is produced by a cyclotron, which is, of course, naturally more expensive, but it has a long physical half-life, so it's not that detrimental. So you don't need an on-site cyclotron. It can be produced off-site. Um, the first pass extraction rate, it ties into the fact that we want the myocardial blood flow directly related to the um, perfusion or accumulation of this radio pharmaceutical. So it's very important that there is a, a good first pass extraction. Um, and then your myocardial clearance also then influences when you can image and when can you re-image. Body clearance also very important. And then we also have to discuss the fact of redistribution. Pet myocardial perfusion agents you might be less familiar with. So your um, ammonia is, um, oh, I forgot the, the radioactive <laughs> nitrogen part there. But anyway, it is done by an on-site cyclotron and your oxygen as well, also an on-site cyclotron. So both of these are, are just available in extremely well-infrastructured environments. Um, you will essentially hook your patient up to the cyclotron, have built-in um, quality control in the lines and directly inject it to the patient from the cyclotron. So it's quite a technical situation. And of course, we, we want to know if the benefits are more substantial than all the effort that's being done. Does it really make a difference in patient outcomes? Nevertheless, very interesting. So yeah, you can imagine a 10 minute half-life or 122 seconds half-life. Um, the average positron energy is the amount of distance the positron travels after radioactive decay before it gives off its positrons. So it or, or like so if the energy is higher, the um, positrons travel further before they have their annihilation event, and this leads to poorer resolution because you know, it's not the exact place of decay, but rather a little bit further. So you can see Iridium 82 is definitely the least optimal where it comes to um, the resolution. And then we have quite a few mechanisms of uptake to discuss here. Um, yeah, Iridium 82, what is uh, maybe the better aspect of it, what makes it different than the others is that it's available via a generator. So you have a whole generator system that you can um, put on a trolley, hook up to the patient while they are on the scanner, and then you can inject them. And this is not then linked to the cyclotron. So this is available for areas who are more dependent on generator product produced radio pharmaceuticals. So even though it's maybe the least optimal from the point of resolution, and we are talking about differences that might not be clinically significant, of course, like we said, uh, you know, severe defects you will always see, and rubidium 82 will definitely be better than technetium, for instance, so it will be having better resolution for sure. It's also something to consider, but the generator-based um, radio pharmaceuticals are very optimal for a clinical point of view. Of course, I think oxygen-15 would be the one that's closest to the real deal. You label oxygen-15 it um, is then perfused into the patient's blood and you really just get a 100% follow of the blood perfusion of the heart. Then finally, fluoropyridase is a, a newish agent. 
we will not discuss it in depth, but it will be mentioned. I have no experience with it, but it is uh, finally finished this year. Um, it, they presented at the American SN Society of Nuclear Medicine um, annual conference. They presented the phase three clinical trial data, and it seems really optimal. But it is quite difficult to make the precursors for radiopharmaceutical production, so I suspect it will not come cheap. It has the 110 minute half life of fluorine 18. It can be done by an off site cyclotron. And it, of course, fluorine 18 has quite ideal imaging characteristics. Also, an extremely high first pass extraction. So let's get back to the one you all know technetium sesta mibi and technetium tetraphosphin both go over the cell with. Passive diffusion, so they will go into the myocardial cells, all of them, the cardiac myocytes. So they get um, transported to the heart by the blood flow. So, of course, we are imaging blood flow, but they accumulate in the areas where the blood flow went to by um, the fusion. And once they cross the barrier, you can see if it's a, a, a live myocardial uh, cell, it will have a negative charge because the mitochondria has a negative charge, and if they are active, they are negative, and then it will get accumulated there. So it will um, go into the mitochondria and then have an affinity for the mitochondria. If the cells are not alive, of course, they cannot accumulate. But mostly the important thing is that it gets distributed to these cells in order to uh, accumulate. So we call them cationic or positively charged radio pharmaceuticals. So this is the mechanism of accumulation. The radio labeling is, um, well, it, it's, it's a bit more technical than most radio pharmaceuticals. So you have your fresh pertinitate illusion, you add it in five milliliters and you have to adhere, of course, to the requirements stated by the uh, manufacturer for how much of the activity you can add. You have to remove an equal amount of air. Be careful not to introduce extra air that can um, influence the amount of stannous chloride in your um, vial, but you have to remove some of the air because you are going to heat this up and you don't want pressure in your vials. So it's very important to remove the air because I think a, a small mini radioactive explosion in your lab is not, not wanted, never wanted. <laughs> then you boil it for 10 minutes and then you have to let it cool down for 15 minutes and then you do QC. Um, I often see that if you don't cool it down for the 15 minutes before doing QC, your data, quality control data, is maybe not not hundred percent the real deal. So I would really prefer people to wait off for the whole fifteen minutes before they do quality control. So this is often something that happens. You get called by the technician and they're like stressed because the labeling wasn't done wasn't good, and then you do QC again and then it's fine. So please, the the heated mixture influences the the quality control. So rather wait that it's cooled down. Um, very important, why do we heat? Um, so it's not for the incorporation of the radio pharmaceutical per se. Uh, the small MIBI, so we call it SESTA MIBI, and for the sake of just being easy on myself not to pronounce these chemical names, even though I also think I'm a chemist, let's just stick to the MIBI part. So it's six MIBIs. So the individual MIBIs are packaged in groups of four to a copper ion. Um, and this is to stabilize it for long-term storage. So you have to heat it up to get your individual MIBIs out. Um, so it's uh, your isocyanide, tumefoxy, methyl propyls. You have to get them out as little small negative MIBIs, and then you can go into your radio labeling with your Technetium 99M. So if you don't heat it up, you have no individual MIBIs to label. This is why we did for 10 minutes. It's really important. It should be boiling for 10 minutes. Um, I've seen very strange things happen in, in, in the radio pharmacy. Um, people uh, having a kettle, frying hot water from the kettle in a mug and putting the maybe in there or, you know, strange things happens. But boil, boiling temperature for 10 minutes and then you cool it for 15 minutes. That's the trick. 
anything that you do different will influence your radio labeling yield. Um, then uh, technetium tetraphosphamine you would see often being advertised as just so much less effort and also having less accumulation in unwanted um, uh, liver accumulation close to the um, heart and all of that. It is a different molecule. I didn't put like the whole chemical labeling process of it, but um, you don't need to heat it. So you just incubate it for 15 minutes. It's totally different chemistry, so it's um, labeling very well. And again, you have to remove the air pressure, um, but you are not heating it up. So this is quite easier to label, but also more expensive, I believe, in, in the countries where I've been, at least. Great, so the technetium tracer is very straightforward. Now we're going to phallium 201. It is um, actively transported. It mimics potassium ions. So um, it's just being taken over by the sodium potassium ATPase pump in active cardiomyocytes. So the redistribution part, of course, you get it uh, from the cyclotron, it gets injected, so there's not really anything uh, manipulation going on in the radio pharmacy. Um, so I'm not going to discuss that per se, but let's focus on the redistribution. So the initial uptake is blood flow dependent, and then it clears very quickly, like we said. And this clearance happens 10 to 15 minutes post-injection, and this has an influence depending on what type of um, lesion we are talking about. And this actually was maybe the original hibernation studies as well. So it gave you some, some idea if you can salvage the, the part of the myocardial tissue that is um, not having blood flow. So in a healthy patient, you will have high blood flow and high uptake, but you will also have fast washout. The images looks the same because, of course, you image the patient at the time of imaging and then you have the um, natural scale, but the amount of radioactivity is, is really low. But tissues compared to one another has still have the same amount of radioactivity. In. So high uptake, high washout, same activity. This is a healthy myocardial perfusion. In hibernation studies during exercise, you have a low blood flow at certain areas and then lower uptake. So this is the one that will have some redistribution because the healthy tissue wash out quickly, but this redistributes to area where there is lower blood flow or very little blood flow, but they are still metabolically active. Remember, they still have the the um, active uh, accumulation mechanism, so the defect will actually disappear because the areas of the high activity will have washout. The areas that are a defect will actually take up this um, radio, uh, the phallium 201 that's washing out. So it will form a more healthy scan afterwards. And this is an indication that you only have hibernating tissue. But you see here it still looks like uh, quite reasonably healthy because of course it's a comparison of one tissue to another so the healthy tissue has lower uptake the defect has now higher uptake so it kind of equalizes throughout so you can really see it in areas where the defect disappears and this is a, a heart that can be salvaged when there is really a defect that is also leading to tissue death you will have a defect that remains in both scans. So it will be um, high uptake in the healthy areas, no uptake in the unhealthy areas. And after the healthy areas, the, the radio, the phallium 201 disappeared or flew, uh, was redistribution or washing out. Sorry, that's the right word. Um, they will not go to this area of the defect because there is no active cells. So they will just redistribute the rest of the body. So you can clearly see that you can distinct, distinctly see three different types of tissue um, situations in this scan. So this was quite um, valuable in the past, but it has disadvantages. Um, like we said, it has an added benefit of viability assessment. You only have one single injection because you do both stress and rest in the same patient. So you first stress the patient, inject the phallium 201, follow them over a time of, of rest, and then you can um, also see redistribution. 
but the photon energy, like we said, is a uh, poor image quality and longer image acquisition and a lot of attenuation artifacts. You also have to image the patient immediately and it has a high whole body radiation dose. Because of the imaging uh, acquisition, uh, the quality, you also have to inject higher radioactive dosages. So Phalum 201 is by no means uh, a, a ideal perfusion agent. So then uh, we move on to the pet perfusion agents. So oxygen, of course, is just acting like water, going freely diffusing over. Your rubidium 82, just like your phalum 201, uh, goes with the potassium sodium pump, but it does not redistribute because the half-life of rubidium 82 is just too short. So it's not really useful. In that sense, so it's just a myocardial perfusion agent, and then your ammonia now correctly um, right, written here, the ammonium 13, uh, nitrogen 13, can um, get incorporated. It's metabolically trapped in the glutamine phase, but it also goes through the sodium potassium pump. So it will also not redistribute because it's trapped inside the cell. So that's the pet perfusion agents in a nutshell. Fluorpyridase, like we said, is a new one on the more well, coming soon, I guess, to be followed. So I would suggest you guys keep an eye out for it. It um, binds specifically to mitochondrial complex one. Um, and yeah, it's also again the positive um, ion, the cation um, linking to the negative mitochondria. Uh, low radiation, better resolution. They actually state that in obese patients, it has exactly the same image quality compared to um, non-obese patients. So this is, I guess, really logical because of the high resolution of pos uh, PET as well as the good uh, positron range and energy of fluorine 18. So this is quite something. And maybe I think this has really a place in the clinic for patients that is not easily imaged by SPECT. Will definitely make life easier. Okay, so then hibernation studies. Um, yeah, since we don't use the phalum 201 redistribution anymore. We had to replace it with some more technologically advanced alternatives. So this is where the FTG comes in, fluorine 18 glucose. So the energy substrates in the heart are free fatty acids as well as glucose. So both radiopharmaceuticals mimicking fatty acids as well as glucose is of use to see abnormalities of metabolism in heart disease. So this is more clinical. You probably can tell me a bit more about this than I can tell you, but um, in the hibernating uh, myocardium, you will definitely see the FTG uptake and reduced maybe uptake. I actually should have added the use of insulin to this um, presentation, which I did not, and also how to prepare a patient for hibernation studies. So I will maybe email you guys afterwards with that and then include it in next year's lectures. Just add that or maybe make another little video on YouTube. So um, basically you just want to um, see the glucose uptake and then on, on the bottom I have the BMIPP tracer um, that is mimicking free fatty acids. So you can also use that. FTG of course goes through the GLUT1 transporter. It gets metabolically trapped in healthy cells. You know, the heart is quite um, quite a, a consumption or a avid user of glucose. So this is basically what we image. Um, the production of FTG I included in the basic overview of radio labeling lecture that you can have a look at, but you should know how, how this works and the production in the radio pharmacy. And then um, the this is just a mentioning of the tracer that... Um, also monitor altered myocardial energy where um, during myocardial damage and ischemia, the fatty acid oxidation is used less because it's more taxing on the heart to use fatty acid metabolism. So you will see areas of less activity when you inject the iodine um, fatty acid 
radio pharmaceutical, iodine-based fatty acid radio pharmaceutical. I'm not sure if this is really used that widely. This is where I am not sure about the the um, production thereof, where you can buy it. I know for sure in South Africa, where I was, it was extremely difficult to get hold of it. Um, and yeah, you have to basically ship it from Europe and it's also being shipped at minus 40 degrees. So it was not something we did. But here is an image from a 2009 publication to just show you the areas of lower fatty acid uptake versus um, higher. So you can see on the bottom is your phallium 201. See here they still used phallium 201 to see that there is actually um, uh, healthy or not uh, enough uh, blood perfusion, but then on top you could see that there is no fatty acid use, so the blood, um, the heart is actually using glucose and prefers that rather than fatty acids. Then we go to the MUGA scan, the multi-acquisitions, multi-gated acquisition, uh, multi acquisition scan where you just measure the heart's structural and dynamic properties, most often used in cancer cardiotoxicity or heart disease with high mortality. So we just look at right ventricular injection fraction or shunts. Red blood cell labeling is an additional video on my YouTube channel that you can have a look at. Do I go really in depth in the production of red blood cell labeling? Maybe we will have time for a lecture at the end of this lecture series um, about all the radio labeling of blood cells and what's available and what's coming in the future because there is some pet red blood cell labeling techniques and white blood cell labeling techniques being developed. But you basically get the in vivo method where you inject the stannous chloride into the patient, afterwards the protagnitate, and then you label the patient's blood in vivo. You get the uh, mixed method where you actually label in a syringe, where you pull up some blood with already everything inside that you need to label the red blood cells, or you can do the in vitro method um, in the laminar airflow. So there is two in vitro methods that you need to know. We will cover that later. It's also on the YouTube video, but uh, the first one was the Brookhaven method often used where you use uh, sodium hypochlorite um, to remove the unabsorbed tin ions. So you first incubate the red blood cells with tin. You remove the ones that's not inside the red blood cells. Then you add your technetium and then it labels only what's inside the red blood cells. And then you can inject it back to the patient. You also have another method where you just use another chemical to remove the tin from the outside, wash it off and then also label. It's two very easy methods to do. Often this is for patients where the um, in vivo method didn't work well, or if they have some additional issues that would influence radio labeling, like maybe some medicine use or some other conditions and you have to rather label outside. But it of course comes at higher risk for your technicians. So of everybody kind of prefers the in vivo method. Uh, cardiac amyloidosis is where you have misfolded proteins, um, it presents as heart failure, failure and then you want to look at uh, cardiomyopathy versus amyloidosis. Um, so yeah, that I leave over to the clinicians, but the um, radio pharmaceuticals that we use are pyrophosphate based um, radio pharmaceuticals. So they are like the diphosphonates that is labeled with technetium, or you have some pet radio pharmaceuticals that target other um, disease uh, processes. So the bone seeking ones is the bisphosphonates, so they bind to what is speculated some calcium deposits in these amyloidosis regions. So you will inject this bone tracer into the patient. Note that we don't use MDP. We rather use pyrophosphate because it's a bit more sensitive for the specific technique. And then you compare the uptake with that of the surrounding ribs or the skeletal. And you score it. Um, 
They say it's unknown, but it is really speculated to be due to calcification. In my opinion, I cannot think of any other way how a bone tracer will get um, stuck in, in this um, amyloids. So there is an article down there that you can also read more on. And then um, it's very sensitive. You can do spec CT these days, and it's also really cheap to do. Um, yeah, and it doesn't show the amyloids that is um, developed during this process. So it really focuses on some um, deposits in this lesion, but not specifically the amyloids. And that's where the PET tracers try to, to alleviate the situation. So mostly these amyloid tracers are actually made um, to target for Alzheimer's disease in the, the brain because there's also these amyloid deposits, but then um, they also made it uh, applicable to the PET radiopharmaceuticals and you can then inject it into the patient image after 15 to 75 minutes and it's quite sensitive. So it binds directly to the amyloids in this um, region. So you can see here, the calcification is where we propose the bisphosphonates are binding, and then the amyloid fibrils is where we have the PET tracers binding. But both of these processes should be present in cardiac, cardiac amyloidosis. PET, of course, um, is still not um, approved by the FDA. It has a longer acquisition time, and maybe there is not so much evidence for the use. But yeah. Then quickly, I will go into pharmacological intervention. Unfortunately, I did not add the insulin or all the interventions you can add during hibernation studies. I will correct that. Um, you have four options that is used often. Um, I know regadenazone is supposed to be uh, a bit... I, I, I think it's more expensive. It's a bit uh, better in certain patient categories that cannot use uh, diperidamol or the other options or the vitamin. Um, but yeah, it's really expensive and there was a, quite a shortage sometimes in some of these um, uh, radio, uh, sorry, pharmaceuticals. So yeah, this is the ones that you have. You should um, know what dosage to give, what side effects to expect, but I think those are all related to um, stress of the patient. I mean, these are really patients who have some defects or suspected defects anyway, and you know how to stop the prescription if you want to um, uh, just stop the therapy. So what is nice of regadenazone is that you can just stop the infusion because of the short half-life of this pharmaceutical, the short biological half-life, you can just stop the infusion and the patient are no longer stressed and will recuperate quickly. Whereas for diperidamol, you quite have to man monitor these patients and that's what making it a bit more risky. The biological half-life, um, the first half-life is 40 minutes and then the longer one is 10 hours. So you really have to monitor these patients well when you give diperidamol. Uh, mechanism of action, diperidamol blocks the um, phosphodiesterase um, enzyme. This is also why it has a longer half-life. It has a longer effect in the cells. Um, so it um, decreases calcium in the end and um, vasodilation is lower. Adenosine A2A antagonist as well as the regadenosone works on the A2A receptor. Regadenosone is A2A specific whereas your adenosine um, is on all of them of course, because that's the um, indigenous um, substrate. Again, <laughs> influencing the adenylate cyclase system, uh, reducing protein kinase, reducing calcium and leading to vasodilation. So all of these kind of work on the same mechanism, but it's more about the half-life and how you can stop the um, action on the patient and also what um, other conditions they have. If you have a patient, for instance, who have um, uh, certain uh, lung conditions, you would rather not have a non-selective agent like adenosine and you would rather want to focus on something that's really selective like regadenosone because you then just block the one receptor, have one mechanism and it's also controllable with a quick um, stopping of the intravenous uh, infusion. So 
Definitely, you should know that. And the vitamin, of course, is a beta-1 adrenergic receptor um, binder, and it leads to contraction of the heart, and you have uh, increased perfusion. So just a final slide on the measurement of cardiac toxicity, and sorry, two slides still to go. So of course, cardiotoxicity in oncology is really important. I'm adding here a really interesting review that you can have a read where they um, speculate about how important the early detection of any dysfunction during chemotherapy is and what we can offer them in the nuclear medicine clinic. I have honor honorable radiopharmaceutical mentions. So imaging of angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels in, in disease um, is really important. I like these angiogenesis targeting um, agents quite a lot. I've done some research on them. It's, it's interesting. Um, imaging of apoptosis and necrosis. Uh, also imaging of any nerve damage, oxygen cons consumption and hypoxia imaging. Fortunately, all of these are also present in other disease processes like uh, oncology, so we will definitely cover them at some point. But they are also worth noticing, uh, noting that you can use this in the whole cardiology array of, of services that you can offer. MIBG and HED are cardiac innervation imaging agents that you will also we will also cover in other lectures, but they are basically looking at heart failure, myocardial ischemia, and infarcts, and then denervation or hyperadrenergic states that you can identify. I want to thank you for your attention. Also thank my students for some of the slides, uh, the pictures that they've drawn. I draw also a lot of them, but I have to thank the people that helped me, of course, Nastasha and Sandile. And then also by render, I have to acknowledge because I used the licensed images from them. And yeah, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, let me just stop this recording. So 